Hi everyone, welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast, updating your electrical safety program, sponsored by Brady Safety Software and Services. My name is Joe Bush. I'm an associate editor with Safety and Health Magazine, and I will be moderating today's session. Thanks for joining us. In a few minutes, we'll start the presentation, but first I want to go over some preliminary items. The views of today's speakers and organizations are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the Council or Magazine endorses those items. At the end of today's webcast, we will conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply type it in the text box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen and click the button for Submit Question. Feel free to ask your question at any time during the presentation. You don't have to wait for the question and answer session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but because of the large number of participants today, we might not get to every question. Any unanswered questions will be forwarded along to today's speakers. For basic troubleshooting information, click the Help button located on your screen. At the end of the webcast, you will be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey. I will let you know more about that after the presentation. This webcast is archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, let's go ahead and let's get started. Our speaker today will be Josh Michaels, Safety Solutions Owner with Brady. Michaels is a licensed electrical engineer with more than 14 years of experience in electrical safety and project management. In addition to performing arc flash services, including assessments, training, audits, reviews, and on-site expert consulting, Michaels is responsible for continuing to develop and expand the company's arc flash offering to best fit evolving safety needs. In addition, as a subject matter expert in arc flash, Michaels leads the sales team and field engineers through technical insight, marketing development, client relations, and more. Thanks to all of you for tuning in to this presentation. Josh, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Wonderful. Thank you very much for the introduction, Joe. Uh, I myself personally greatly appreciate everyone's time today. I know how important everyone's time is. So again, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we'll jump right into the information and um, give you a little bit of background overall about um, ArcFlash about the new changes in the 2018. Everyone uh, should be familiar at this point that uh, we are on a three-year code cycle. 2018 has recently been released and is uh, you know, gonna be out into the public and accepted and adopted here this coming month. Talk a little bit about updating your Arc Flash risk assessment overall and what you yourself should be doing to stay compliant with, of course, uh, the number one goal in mind being that focus on safety. Whenever we talk about arc flash, you know, everyone's getting very familiar with what it is these days. There's no shortage of images on Google, uh, YouTube, things like that, where you can go and you look on there and see all sorts of stuff that can be very scary. Never want to scare anyone when we're talking about arc flash, but we certainly want everyone to have an understanding about it and respect it because electrical safety is one of those things that everyone really, really needs to pay attention to. So why is electrical safety so important? Uh, whenever I talk about arc flash and give presentations or training all over the world, I like to sit down and just kind of talk about the basics up front. Ideally, we want to reduce everyone's exposure to risks and ultimately reduce or prevent injuries. That's what the point of the standards are, and that's why we do all this, uh, this type of work. Also comes in a regulatory compliance. Safety is always our main goal, but there is, of course, the regulatory side, which leads into a company's you know, bottom line, dollars, unscheduled shutdowns, all those types of things that do come to consideration. Starting to come across more and more customers that are telling me their insurance companies are really pushing these things. So again, we like to focus on safety, but there is the other side of this that people do um, need to pay attention to as far as the regulatory concerns are insurance costs and things like that. So what are the electrical hazards that we're all concerned with? Pretty straightforward, talking about electrical shocks, burns, arc flash, arc blast, and of course fire ignition. 
If you look at NFPA 70E, the 2018 version, you go to the back in Annex K, there's a really good breakdown of what these different hazards are and what they look like. Two basic categories again, electrical shocks and electrical burns. When we talk electrical burns, that can be broken down even further into arc burns, thermal burns, and conductive burns. Electrical shock, pretty straightforward, right? Current enters the body, exits the body through uh, another point of contact, results in electrocution. When we talk arc flash, a lot of times you'll hear people just use the term arc flash, but understand that there's two different things there. There's the arc flash and the arc blast. Flash is uh, the release of energy caused by the electric arc. Fragment, uh, plasma fragments, spray, molten material, all sorts of stuff coming at you. The blast is that pressure wave caused by the expansion of the gases. When we talk about arc flash, it's also important to think about some of the other things that can uh, result in even greater risks. For instance, elevated locations. Anytime we're doing work in an elevated location, if we have to have on some type of fall protection, it's important to think about the fact that that fall protection should also be arc rated. Doing work in, con in confined spaces also can increase the potential risks that are associated with electrical hazards. Talk about what can happen as a result of these risks. Of course, there's the direct stuff that everyone thinks of, electrocutions, burns, things like that. But don't also forget about the indirect results, the falls, smoke inhalation, things like that. When we're dealing with arc flash, also important to focus on some of the really basic facts behind it. These things are very, very violent, uh, catastrophic, catastrophic events. It is literally a bomb going off. When I talk to our customers, I always you know, point out the fact that when we do an arc flash risk assessment, what we're really trying to help you do is understand when you walk up to a piece of equipment, if you have to open it while energized, what are you dealing with? Is it a firecracker or is it a nuclear weapon? And then based on whatever those risk factors are and how extreme that explosion is going to be, we help you understand what PPE you need to wear. Is it as simple as putting on non-melting natural cotton fibers, safety glasses, hard hat, hearing protection, gloves, you know, leather footwear, the basic stuff, or do you have to step up and put on a 40 cal suit or even higher? In an arc flash, temperatures can reach up to 35,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's four times hotter than the sun. That's a lot of heat, a lot of thermal energy coming out of that explosion. If you're not wearing rated clothing or if you're wearing improperly, improperly rated clothing, the stuff you're wearing can spontaneously combust, basically, and be up in flames within uh, a second. Very, very rapid uh, expansion of energy that heat cause a lot of damage and, like I said, start your clothing on fire instantly. When we're looking at these temperatures, copper buses buses can vaporize, and if something like that happens, we're going to turn about one cubic inch of copper into 39 cubic feet of gas. So not only do you have the explosion and the fire to deal with, you also have these gases that you could potentially be breathing in in these arc flash events. So it's very important to get away from these if you're ever around one, even if you're wearing the proper clothing. Of course, there's the very intense UV and IR light waves that can do damage to your, your sight, your eyes. Uh, very high pressure, 2,000 pounds per square feet. Those pressures can do damage in a lot of different ways. Uh, the human body, your lungs, can start experiencing damage around 1,730 pounds. Your uh, ears, 720 pounds. So in an arc blast, of course, there's uh, certainly enough pressure to do damage to your body in different ways. You know, Even if you're not near the explosion, you can be knocked off a ladder or various different things like that. Again, this is a bomb going off. Very loud sound. Sound levels can be up to 155, 160 decibels. Uh, hearing damage starts about 120 decibels. So, of course, wearing the ear inserts is a piece of PPE that must be worn at all levels of arc flash, and that's something that sometimes gets overlooked by people. And then, of course, you know, due to those high temperatures, we have molten metal. 1,900 degrees Fahrenheit is when uh, copper starts to melt. And so in this explosion, you're going to have molten metal, uh, and other pieces of shrapnel flying about at 1,000 feet per second coming out of that explosion. Again, very, very dangerous, very catastrophic, catastrophic event. So what do we do about all this? You know, we know it's very dangerous. We know there's a lot of stuff going on. That's where 70E really comes into play. 
70E applies to all employees who install, maintain, or repair electrical equipment and are exposed to electrical hazards. Pretty simple book to get into and look at. If you've ever cracked open 70E, you see that it's not very big. Uh, it's broken down into three chapters, and really where most of the important information is contained is in Chapter 1, which is the base standard for compliance with OSHA. OSHA is the main legal body, legal entity, that enforces uh, our flash electrical safety. If you get into OSHA, though, and you look through it, not a lot of very detailed information about how you have to go about being safe. So OSHA recognized this, and they talked to the NFPA guys and said, hey, can you write us another standard that gives us more detail, it gives people more detail, more information on what they need to do to be safe? So that's really where NFPA 70E came from. If you look at NFPA 70, uh, the current version that we have, 2018, this is actually the 11th revision. It dates back to 1979. And in the, if you're curious about the history of it at all, uh, there's a, a really good summary in the front of the 2018 version that kind of walks through the history of the book and the different versions and, and what updates were made over the course of time. So, all right. So what are some of the major changes that we've gone through? When I look at the, the progression of how NFPA 70 has changed over the course of time, the 2015 um, cycle had quite a few pretty big things in there um, that, that, shook, that shook up the industry a little bit for people and you know, had a lot of people asking questions and, and looking different ways, like uh, dropping category zero, right? A lot of labels out there still have category zero. Some people were concerned about that. Do I need to print new labels and so on and so forth? When I look at the 2015 to the 2018 version, I don't see a whole lot that really, you know, game changers that people are going to start really getting concerned about or asking a lot of questions. But what I do see is a really good progression um, continuing, you know, from 2012 to 15 to 18 that's really putting the focus on that, you know, the risk assessment and making sure that we're really looking at um, reducing the risks and in 2015, the focus was more on recognizing uh, the risks and avoiding it. Now, the focus has really shifted to become reducing the risks. So there's a lot of focus on the safety program and things like that. So we'll kind of touch on that as we, as we get through this. Um, up front, I, I like to start with the definitions. <clears throat> when I look at the definitions in here, there's not a lot of major modifications. Uh, some of the definitions were defined or uh, modified a little bit. Not a whole lot of change here, but what I do see is, you know, they make a lot of little changes that are trying to clarify things and, and really put the emphasis on, you know, recognizing the risks. So, for instance, a couple of the different uh, definition changes, accident has been replaced with incident, accidental and accidentally have been replaced with unintentional or unintentionally. Uh, qualified person, this was a, an interesting one. It, it now talks about um, reducing the risks instead of avoiding it. You know, I personally, when you think about it, you know, avoiding the risks is, of course, a good thing to do. You know, perform lockout, tagout, make sure that everything's de-energized. If you're always avoiding the risks, you know, you're not going to have any issues. But in the real world, we understand that there are risks out there and we're going to have to deal with them. So the best thing we can do is really focus on reducing those risks. In uh, definitions, it talks about arc flash hazard. It used to be just referred to as a dangerous condition. Now it's uh, been replaced with the definition that says a source of possible injury or damage to the health. Um, as far as uh, electrical safety is concerned, it, uh, recognizing was replaced with identifying, minor change again, when it relates to the arc flash boundary, two different changes. Added distance was replaced with approach limit, and second degree burn was uh, changed to at a point with incident energy equaling 1.2 calories per centimeter squared. Change in the verbiage, but really no change in practice. You know, 1.2 calories per centimeter squared has always been recognized as that threshold of a second degree burn. So they're just kind of changing the verbiage around a little bit. Some new definitions uh, that were added in the 2018 version, you can see here on the screen, first one being electrical safety program. Not a new idea. I mean, electrical safety programs were certainly covered in the 2015 version. And if you want to be compliant and, you know, really have a good focus on safety, of course, you have electrical safety program in play. 
but they did add a definition to it now. It says a docu uh, document system consisting of electrical safety principles, policies, procedures, and processes that directs activities appropriate for the risk associated with the electrical hazards. So again, we're looking at uh, identifying, uh, we're not just identifying and avoiding everything, we're really putting a focus on reducing the risks. Uh, definitions for fault current and available fault current were added. I think these were two good definitions to add. Again, not new ideas. These were things that were addressed previously, um, but the definitions weren't there. And when I do training, I spend a lot of time talking to people about fault currents and available fault currents on the engineering side. Uh, and the reason for that being is these are two important definitions or a very important concept that's wrapped up into the Arc Flash PPE categories table. Uh, I'll touch on that table a little bit later today when we talk about some of the other training. But uh, for those of you that are familiar with that table, you know if you're going to use that table, you have to have an understanding of fault current and available fault current. So uh, two important definitions that I think they added, and again, I'll touch on that later. Also added a definition for condition of uh, maintenance. I think this is, again, an important definition to add. Uh, in practice, I don't see a lot of change here overall. Um, condition of maintenance is something that should have been pulled into and taken into consideration in the past. Um, but again, now they have a definition for it. So what they're really getting at here is the condition of maintenance is very important when you're doing an arc flash risk assessment or just looking at anything from a risk perspective at all. You know, things aren't maintained properly. Uh, things are falling apart. Things are rusty. You know, hinges are broken, things like that. It just makes a, a situation more dangerous. And when you perform an arc flash risk assessment, <clears throat> by the infinite energy analysis method, which looks at overcurrent protective devices, you know, fuses, circuit breakers, the calculations assume, based on the software, that those breakers and things are going to function as per the manufacturer, the way they made them. So if those things aren't maintained, if breakers aren't exercised, the calculations could be 100% accurate based on the data, but due to the fact that condition of maintenance isn't that good, it might result in incident energies being higher than what's on that label. So maintenance is a very, very important thing, and pulling that definition to that starts, uh, putting that definition here starts to bring some more uh, clarity to that. Working distance, again, another new definition, distance between a person's face and chest area and prospective arc uh, source. Again, not a new idea. Just put the definition in here to help clarify so when we talk working distance, uh, it's, a, it's an important concept to understand when people are, you know, walking up to a piece of equipment, going to do some type of work, maybe either doing voltage testing for lack of take up, still need to wear our PPE. Uh, we look at that arc flash label, see the incident energy on there, what PPE to wear. It's important to understand that that working distance is probably 18 inches, and that's telling us what we need to wear where we're standing. So just another definition that they added to help clarify things. All right, so getting more into the overall body of the document itself, um, starting off with uh, Article 105, Application of Safety Related Work Practices and Procedures. Article 105, pretty short, really sets the stage for the overall document, right? It talks about Chapter 1, how it covers electrical safety related work practices and procedures for employees who are exposed to electrical hazards in the workplace. And then talks about how we need to use safety practices in order to help keep our employees safe, right? Pretty straightforward. In the 2015 version, uh, this article just addressed the employer responsibility. Now it's subdivided it uh, to help draw attention to the fact that, you know, it's not just the employer that has responsibilities here, it's also the employee that's responsible to do stuff. So the, the big thing there is uh, from the employee responsibility says the employee shall comply with the safety related work practices and procedures provided by the employer. You know, we're all adults here, right? So as, as the employer, it's our responsibility to set the standard, provide the training, document things, and put it all out there. But we're not also out there babysitting everyone every day, right? And so the employee then, of course, has the responsibility to follow all these uh, various different procedures and practices put in place and put the PP on and actually wear it when they're doing any type of job task that's going to require it. There's also some new text indicating that the first priority uh, in the implementation of safety related work practices shall be hazard elimination. 
Uh, I think that's a pretty powerful uh, statement. Hazard elimination shall be the first priority in the implementation of safety-related work practices. So even though, you know, I said 2018 is, is about reducing the risks instead of just recognizing them and avoiding them, um, it, is, it is, of course, important to focus on hazard elimination up front. All right, so uh, moving on, we get into a little bit into Article 110, uh, general requirements for electrical safety-related work practices. When I look at Article 110, and I do a page flip between 2015 to, to 2018, what I basically see here is a lot of it seems to be reorganized and um, some stuff added mostly to, art, to Article 110.1, the Electrical Safety Program. What I think they did a lot in 2018 is uh, a lot of reorganizing, and what they were really trying to do is put stuff in, in more of an order that makes it more logical and makes it easier to follow. Uh, so that people can, um, you know, quite simply understand the regs better and follow along and, and really focus on what's important. So uh, the big stuff here, Article 110.1, Electrical Safety Program. Uh, they added a need for inspection uh, of new or revised equipment before being uh, placed into service. Pretty straightforward idea. Anytime you add something new, there should be an inspection to make sure everything's put into place right. Uh, you know, some people refer to this as electrical commissioning. They also talked about uh, uh, the risk assessment procedure. The procedures must address the potential for human error and incorporate a hierarchy of risk control methods. What they're looking at here um, is kind of an evolution from 2015 to, to 2018. You know, in 2015, I said they really started to focus more on risk. They brought in the idea of risk assessment versus hazard. Evolution here now gets more into, um, you know, looking at the human factors, human error is part of that assessment, and they added an entire annex, Annex Q, in the back of NFP 7018 that focuses on humans, human performance and work in the workplace and electrical safety overall. So uh, when you look at the annexes in the back, annexes are not, uh, by definition, part of the code requirements, uh, the additional information that's out there that you can utilize. But again, they really want to focus on, okay, we've got all these risks, how does the, the human factor come into play, the potential for human error? You know, when you think about arc flash, most of these events are caused in some way, shape, or form by human error. So it's really important to kind of take a look at that and, you know, roll that into your overall safety program. As I said, one of the big things in 2018 was really uh, this focus on the overall, you know, electrical safety program. Quite a few new sections were added. So they added sections really to the job safety planning job briefings, change in scope, and incident investigations. You know, the job safety planning, you know, being a really, really important big part of this. It talks about, you know, before doing any type of work that might be energized or might have these risks, um, a, a job safety plan should be completed by a qualified person, must be documented, and it should include, you know, description of the job, tasks, identification of the hazards, puts the focus on a shock risk assessment and an arc flash risk assessment, any work procedures involved, uh, and all those different aspects that roll into doing any type of work where you're facing these electrical risks. So a uh, big piece of 2018 is really making sure you have that solid electrical safety program. Article 110.2, training requirements. Again, most of this is just uh, you know reorganizing of the material. A lot of information that used to be in Article 120, the lockout, tagout stuff, has been relocated to Article 110.2. Same information, just pulled it, you know, back into the training section, really to put that emphasis on training and make sure that that stuff's getting done. As far as when training should occur, uh, every three years, that's the same. You know, nothing changed there. Training should still occur every three years. But now... It also indicates that you must be retained, trained if any of the job duties are changing. Uh, it also talks about retraining should be done any, um, you know, any time that you're out there doing a, an annual supervision of, a, of your employee's work. If you see things that aren't being followed, then there should be some additional retraining. One other minor change, uh, 110 talks about, you know, uh, AED training and things like that. As far as first aid, emergency response, and resuscitation are concerned, 2015 said that that stuff should be done annually. 
Now it just says that uh, these should be done at a frequency to satisfy requirements of the certifying board. So it puts the ball a little more into your court. You, know, you don't, it doesn't force the annual training, but of course they still have to have first aid emergency response resuscitation training. Article 120, establishing electrically safe work condition. Article 120, uh, again, for those of you that have been in this document before, is all about the lockout tagout um, process. Similar to Article 110, when I look through Article 120 and do a page flip between 15 and 18, much of what I'm seeing is just reorganization. And this section was very, very heavily reorganized. And the idea here is, again, for the most part, to make things you know, easier to follow and put it in a logical order of progression. Uh, one thing that was new is there was an exception for uh, simple procedures, simple lockout tagout procedures, and, and the way that reads is lockout tagout is not required for work on cord and plug connected equipment for which exposure to hazards uh, of unexpected ener energization of the equipment is controlled by the unplugging of the equipment from the energy source provided that the plug is under the exclusive control of the employee performing the work, uh, performing, excuse me, the servicing and maintenance for the duration of that work. Pretty simply, what that's saying here is, you know, for some of these simple cord and plug uh, pieces of equipment, don't necessarily have to have a written simple procedure, but of course you still do have to have that simple, uh, you know, a procedure in place where, you know, whoever's using that equipment knows how to disconnect it. Looking at Article 120, probably one of the bigger things that changed is, as far as lockout tagout is concerned, it used to be a six-step process. They've added two additional steps in there. Uh, releasing the stored uh, electrical energy and release or block any stored mechanical energy. I think the biggest takeaway that I had when I looked through Article 120 regarding lockout tagout was that, you know, if you already have a really good solid lockout tagout program at your at your company, really isn't any changes in Article 120 that that are going to affect you. You know, make sure you're releasing that stored electrical energy. But uh, most lockout tagout programs that I've seen are doing that already. But again, just mostly a reorganization of, of what's there and uh, focus on, of course, de-energizing prior to doing any work. Article 130, work involving electrical hazards. Again, I see this uh, section having uh, quite a bit of uh, reorganization, but getting into it, there are some you know, pretty important things that, that did change that you know, are gonna have some minimal effect on the way people look at things. 130.4, shock risk assessment was modified to require documentation. That's spelled out now. Most people, you know, if you're doing an arc flash risk assessment, that shock assessment, that stuff is already being documented, but make sure that anytime you do this type of work, you're documenting all that stuff and you have that on record. Uh, so if anything ever happens or if anything ever comes up, you can produce that documentation. Um, there's also now more information included regarding additional protective measures. So what that looks like is anytime that there's you know, a, a, a shock risk, anytime additional protective measures are needed, you have to look at, you know, what is the voltage that the person will be exposed to? What are those boundary requirements? And, um, you know, what is the PPE that's required to protect against this? So in practice, overall, in my opinion, these are all things that were being done, but they're clear, they're, they're spelled out a little more clearly now in the document. 130.5 arc flash risk assessment was modified in a very similar fashion to 130.4, again, to identify the hazards, uh, estimate the likelihood of occurrence, and, and determine if additional protective measures are required. What, this, what these kind of point to is table 130.5C. 130.5C uh, is a table in there that talks about a whole lot of different uh, activities that can take place, you know, for instance, flipping a circuit breaker or something like that. Um, the table then talks about equipment condition and it talks about the likelihood of occurrence. In the previous 2015 version, this table was associated directly with um, the arc flash PPE table method for figuring out your uh, risk assessment. Now this table is pulled a little further up in section 130 and the idea now is that it can be used for both methods. You know, again, in the past, it wasn't used for incident energy analysis method. It was just used for that table method. Um, changed the verbiage a little bit before. Now the focus is on the likelihood of occurrence 
before it was just uh, PPE required, yes or no. In practice, I don't think it changes a whole lot. Uh, just a little different way of looking at it. And But what it boils down to at the end of the day is if you're doing any type of activity where there's a likelihood of occurrence of an accident, or basically if there's a risk there, you have to be putting on PPE. You have to be taking these additional protective measures, right? Next thing I saw in there is 130.5G, Innocent uh, Incident Energy Analysis Method. Uh, basically, it says incident energy analysis methods should be reviewed for accuracy at intervals not to exceed five years. That's really the same requirement that they had before. They just kind of uh, repositioned where that was in there. Draw a little more attention to it. Taking a little closer look at that table, 135G. Uh, this is actually a brand new table and it can be used with incident energy analysis method for selecting of our flash PPE. According to the authors of 2018, this was actually one of the, uh, the most notable changes for the 2018 edition and that's that uh, the tables in the text that specified PPE were moved um, out of the back of the book into the actual uh, you know, 130.5 section itself. So this table, 130.5G, used to be in the back uh, in, the, in an annex, and now um, they pulled it into the front to, to really make sure that there was no confusion. What, what is happening um, is, again, there's two different ways to do an arc flash risk assessment, and I'll touch on this just in a little bit on one of my slides. There's that incident energy analysis method where an engineer comes out uh, or a consultant comes out and you know, goes through your electrical system, gathers a whole bunch of data, performs calculations and tells you exactly what your incident energy analysis is. You know, again, they're telling you, are we dealing with a, a firecracker or a nuclear weapon? There's also uh, the PPE tables method. The PPE tables method breaks down the category of PPE into one, two, three, and four. That stuff in 2015 was pretty clearly identified, um, but was what was lacking was the fact that for the incident energy analysis method, the PPE table was in the back. So now they pulled that in the front uh, to avoid confusion and make sure that people aren't looking at incident energy analysis and trying to fit stuff into the, the PPE category. So they're, um, overall, it doesn't change in practice what should be going on, but it just, again, helps, helps to clarify things a little bit. 130.5H, uh, equipment labeling. This is a new part that they put in here that I think for me personally made a lot of difference in really helping uh, speak to people that have done assessments in the past and have labels. Uh, there's a new exception that I think really um, it replaces an exception that was there. They expanded upon it and it, I think it really helps clarify things. So I like this and I'm going to read it. It says, unless changes in electrical distribution system render the label inaccurate, labels applied prior to the effective date of, uh, of this edition of the standard shall be acceptable if they complied with the requirements for equipment labeling in the standard in effect at the time the labels were applied. Uh, so now, you know, if you've had an assessment done in the past and you have a bunch of labels, I get the question all the time, do we need to replace our labels? Category zero is no longer here. You know, um, we had an assessment done nine years ago. Do we need to completely reassess our entire electrical system? And what that really boils down to is, well, have changes been made? If everything is still the same as it was, you know, equipment's still in the same places, breakers, fuses are all the same, you know, wires haven't been changed. If the labels met the code standard at the time they were installed, they are still good. So I think that's a really powerful statement for a lot of people to, to help really clarify things. Moving on. Um, Big, uh, one of the bigger changes, I guess you could say also, is the way NFPA 70E starts uh, looking at personal protective gear and other equipment. Uh, in previous editions, employers were, and, and still are, of course, required to verify the appropriate PPE is given to the employees. Um, Section 137C14B was, was added to provide guidance on conformity assessment of the PPE. Uh, these changes, the changes that were made in this section, of course, do not you know, alter the employer's responsibility to determine the validity of the PPE manufacturer's claims, um, but they're, they're putting more 
um, more pressure on these, you know, standards to make sure that everything does conform. Um, Got to be careful when you look at this stuff, you know. The PP coming from another uh, country manufactured somewhere else, they might have their own codes and standards. So you got to really make sure you're paying attention and make sure that all the, the labels and everything that garments pass, all the tests applicable to, you know, federal local codes and standards. Um, one other note in 137A that I noticed, they, they it used to talk about how uh, everything should be de-energized when an infinite energy exceeds 40 calories per centimeter squared. They actually removed that uh, informational note, and I think the reason they did that is because what was happening is people looked at that note and said, oh, I'm not over 40 cal, so I don't need to worry about de-energizing. Um, but by removing that note, they're basically saying that, hey, you know, we should always be putting the focus on de-energizing, period. Regardless of the incident energy in play here, let's de-energize and we don't have to worry about it then, right? You still need to put your PP on and you're performing your lockout tagout voltage testing, but once you've, you know, locked everything out successfully, removed uh, the voltage, removed the risk, then you're, you know, you're in a, a safe working environment. All right, so I've touched on this a few times, you know, the different methods. Um, everyone out there should be doing some type of R-flash risk assessment in order to stay compliant. Electricity is a recognized risk. I don't think there's any question about that. So for any recognized risk or hazard, uh, the employer has to make sure they're providing their employees with a safe workplace. So two different methods for conducting your assessment. There's that incident energy analysis method that I've talked about, 130.5G, and there's also the ArcFlash PP categories method, 137C15. Uh, these two methods used to be right next to each other in the uh, 2015 version of the code, and now they've separated them, and, and again, they reorganize things to, to really show that these are two different methods. Um, the tables that were used for the ArcFlash PP categories method in the past are still the same uh, in the 2018 version. Didn't make any changes to the tables themselves really for this piece. They did change the numbering, uh, but again, the table itself still contains the same information. The change that you might notice there, like I said previously, right in front of the ArcFlash PPE categories method table, there used to be that do I need PPE table. Uh, you know, talked about the different activities and yes or no, whether or not I need PPE. They again pulled that further up in uh, the document itself, and it now that table can relate to both incident energy or the R-Flash PPE categories method. When you're considering which method you want to use, it's important to kind of think about and understand, you know, what applications do these really work well for? The incident energy analysis method is going to be your best course of action. And again, this is having a, a consultant or someone who knows uh, how to uh, gather the data and perform the calculations, having them come out to your site, review your entire electrical system. Uh, they're pulling information on wire sizes, wire lengths, fuses, breakers, manufacturers, and passes, all that stuff, putting it into software and figuring out exactly what that incident energy is. And that determination then results in, well, what PPE do I need to wear? And again, there's a table in NFPA 70 2018 version that specifically you know, takes the results of that incident energy analysis and then points you to what PPE you need to wear. If you don't go to that level uh, of work, there is the R-Flash PPE categories method. Uh, R-Flash PPE categories method, for those of you, you know, that recall back prior to 2015, there used to be a category zero. Uh, 2015, they changed it, and 2018 still has the same four categories, just one, two, three, and four. The PPE that results from that, you can see examples of in the pictures here on the, on the right side of the screen. Um, but it's very important to note, if you're going to use the PPE category method, that should be done under some type of engineering supervision. There are parameters listed on that table. Remember the fault current um, that I mentioned up front, the definitions? You have to know your fault current to properly use the table, and you also have to know the fault clearing time of the breaker. Uh, two very important things that, uh, you know, if, if you don't understand how this stuff works, those are two pieces of data that you might not fully comprehend. And if you don't know that data, you really should not be using the table 
because you could very quickly get yourself into some trouble. Um, you know, I've, I've helped people use the table on many circumstances, and one of the, the basic line entries uh, in that table talks about equipment rated, you know, um, that falls into the 480 volt classification, and that would be category two. Well, when you look at any given facility out there, uh, you know, most switchboards and things like that would fall into that line as being a piece of equipment that's 480 volt. And if you do, if you look at it, what usually happens is your fault current is usually substantially more than what that table allows. And that puts you, you know, with, if you actually did the calcs, you'd see that you'd be needing, uh, you know, 40 cal suits or typically uh, much higher than that, actually. So be very, very careful if you're going to use the category method, those tables in, in NFPA 70E, make sure that you're, you know, looking at those parameters and that that table can be, uh, you know, used um, properly. Now, some people might say, well, you know, as long as we can use those categories properly, why would we ever go to the level of using an incident energy analysis? One of the, one of the big differences there comes into play is, you know, well, if you're using the tables, if you're using them properly, they're typically very conservative. So you might find yourself wearing category two uh, or uh, PPE, you know, wearing the face shield, balaclava, uh, eight cal shirt and pants, when in reality, all you might need is, you know, the, the non-melting natural fiber cotton and safety glasses. So using the, the categories can oftentimes put your employees in substantially more PPE than they would need to actually do the job. Of course, wearing more PPE is not, a, you know, not the worst thing in the world. You're overprotected, right? But the problem then becomes is, you know, a lot of times it, it makes it harder to do your job. So your assessment is staying compliant. The biggest thing to do is make sure everything's up to date. Uh, you know, one quote I like to read out of the code, it says, the method of calculating uh, and the data to support the information for the label shall be documented. The, date, the data shall be reviewed for accuracy at intervals not to exceed five years, where the review of the data identifies a change that renders the label inaccurate. The label shall be updated. It also says the owner of the electrical equipment shall be responsible for the documentation, installation, and maintenance of the marked labels. So, you know, that's really a fancy way of saying um, anytime you make a change to your electrical system, if you, you know, you take a piece of equipment and you move it, uh, that's going to invalidate that label that's on there. The distance of the conductors impacts those calculations, therefore you would need a new label. You have a new line. Uh, added to your manufacturing uh, facility, maybe, you know, you add a new wing to your building, whatever that might be. Anytime you make a change to the electrical system or a change to the equipment, there's also a resulting impact to those labels. And if you want to stay compliant, you need to go ahead and update those things. What code calls out is, you know, intervals not to exceed five years. I get the question a lot, hey, it's been five years, we need to redo our assessment. If everything, and to kind of go back to what I talked about already, if nothing changed, you know, five years goes by and nothing changed, your equipment's still in the same spots, your breakers, your fuse, everything's the same, then those labels can still be accurate. But you do need to have someone come in and do a review to make sure that everything's still accurate and, and overall that, you know, nothing's changed. So real quick, you know, 70E, of course, talks about the required labels. As far as what needs to be on those labels, nothing changed from 2015 to 2018. Nominal system voltage, arc flash boundary, and at least one of the following incident energy and working distance, or the arc flash PPE category, um, but not both. That's one of those changes that was uh, highlighted in from 2012 to 2015, where most labels printed prior to that had an incident energy and a category on there. Now you want to see one or the other. So if you've had a label printed since 2015, chances are it doesn't indicate a category. That doesn't mean it's wrong. That, that actually means it's correct. But what your focus needs to be on is, hey, what's that incident energy? You know, 0 0.45 cals per centimeter squared, 6.7, whatever that might be, that tells you directly, you know, what PPE you need to put on. Um, and just so everyone knows and we're all on the same page, you know, there's no uh, official required format for these labels. I see a lot of different shapes, a lot of different sizes. What's important is that the same information is on there. I also see a lot of different colors out there. Most of what I see will include an orange uh, warning header on there. If it gets over 40 cal, you'll see a red danger header. 
you know, those things are done in accordance with ANSI, but also understand that, you know, ANSI isn't necessarily a code, and you can use different colors and verbiage, um, but the idea there is if you're going to do something like that, you can't, you can't make it more dangerous. It has to be clear. So I certainly do uh, see different formats of labels, but just make sure that you're including the important stuff on there that's required by NFPA 70E. Another question I get, what requires a label? As far as, uh, you know, what the definition in 70E includes 2015 to 2018, there was a very, very minor, minor change. Uh, it used to list off a bunch of different things and then say, you know, anything that requires a label, you know, must be uh, field marked. Now it just says it must be marked. Very minor change, but as far as what needs to be labeled, no change is there. And by definition, you know, it lists off a couple things, switchboards, panel boards, industrial control panels, uh, motor control centers, and other than dwelling units, and it boils it down to if they are likely to require examination, adjustment, servicing, maintenance while energized, they shall be marked with a label containing that information that we just talked about. You know, with the most important piece on there, in my opinion, being that incident energy. That incident energy tells you is it a firecracker? Is it a nuclear weapon? You know, and then of course the boundaries on there that the boundaries keep other people at a far enough distance away that they're not going to get not going to get injured. So when you look at what requires a label, though, you got to ask yourself a question: Where are the risks? You know, if there's anything that uh, your employees or you know if you're the maintenance staff, there's anything that you're opening up while energized, or if you're performing lockout, tagout, and doing that voltage test, that's the energized test. Anything that you have to get into, if it's over 50 volts, there's a risk there. It should have an arc flash warning label on it. So just, you know, to kind of wrap it all up, if I want to stay compliant, if you want to stay compliant, there's some, you know, a handful of, of key things to focus on. I think really 2018 made it very, very clear that they want to see that written electrical safety program. They want, you know, focus on the policies and the procedures. Um, Make sure you're doing those inspections, factor in human error, the hierarchy of risk control methods. Um, that's something that used to be in an annex. They pulled that hierarchy of risk control methods into the actual front of the standard. So now that's not optional. That's something that needs to be looked at. You know, we talked today a lot about that job safety planning, you know, making sure you're doing that stuff up front before getting into uh, any type of uh, a risky procedure or activity. Take a look at all that stuff, Jobs brief, job briefings, anytime there's a change in scope, you should be, you know, redoing your job safety plan, things like that. Um, electrical safety training, very important piece to this. You know, I mentioned up front that OSHA doesn't get into a whole lot of detail about stuff, but, uh, you know, OSHA certainly in their documentation talks about electrical safety training. So really make sure that you're providing that training to your, uh, any employees that are getting into any type of energized gear or, you know, panel boards, control panels, or whatever it might be, if they're opening something up that's energized, they need to have that training. And then, of course, that should be done at intervals not to exceed three years. Uh, arc flash risk assessment needs to be done, right? Make sure uh, that any, any type of equipment where there's a risk, you're doing an assessment on to get that label on there so that we know, you know, what type of PPE do we need to wear. And then, of course, that leads to that proper PPE. Make sure you have that available. Uh, make sure your employees are wearing it. Um, if you're the, you know, if you're the person out there that has to put it on, make sure you're putting it on. I wear this stuff myself all the time. It's not always comfortable, you know, but at the end of the day, I want to make sure I'm coming home uh, to my wife and kids and I get to go, you know, do the things on the weekend that I love to do. Uh, I, I myself live up here in uh, Minneapolis, so getting to the time of year, we get to go snowmobiling and ice fishing and all that kind of fun stuff, so I want to make sure I get to go home safe. And, uh, you know, my goal and, and the goal of Brady is to make sure we're helping all of you get to go home safe at the end of the day and, and do what it is that you love to do. With that, I think uh, we have some time left over for any uh, questions or discussions. Joe? Excellent. Great job, Josh. Thanks for your insights and ex expertise. Before we start the Q&A, I want to remind everyone of the evaluation survey we are asking you to complete. The survey should be appearing on your screen. Your input is important because it will help us improve future webcasts. If you do not see the evaluation survey on your screen, please turn off your pop-up blocker. You may also access the survey by clicking the survey button near the lower right part of your screen. Now, 
Let's get to some questions. What should be included in our training? Good question. So training is one of those things where um, OSHA and NFPA 70E, you know, it's not cut and dry. They don't give you a, a, a specific uh, training program that's going to cover every different type of activity out there or every different type of facility that people might work into. And, and the reason they don't do that is that would be extremely difficult to do. But when it comes to your training program, uh, what, what needs to happen is if, you know, if you're the employer or you're the person that is out there bringing people in to do any type of work, you have to look at what activities that you're asking them to do. And then you have to make sure you're providing them uh, the proper training that's needed for them to do those tasks. So, so NFPA 70 and OSHA do outline uh, some common tasks that everyone should be able to do. Uh, for instance, a couple that you'll see in both of those documents, uh, the ability to identify if something's live uh, and the ability to determine a nominal voltage, two very basic things, right? And those kind of both boil down to, well, how do I use a multimeter? If you're doing any type of electrical work, you know, that's a, that's a very important skill to have is using that multimeter. But then a lot of the rest of it really boils down to, you know, what the, the what I commonly refer to or what the code will talk about is being task qualified, you know, making sure you give your employees all the knowledge they need to, to do the tasks that they face. So uh, under the ability to understand the risks, you know, understand those, read those art flash labels they have on there, know how to use the safety work permit or whatever else, one other procedures you may have that are wrapped up in your electrical safety, safety program. But, um, you know, again, it, it really boils down to what tasks you're asking them to do and providing them uh, the training to go out and perform those tasks. We had an assessment done six years ago and have a lot of labels of category zero. Do we need a new assessment or new labels? Great question. Uh, that's something that I, I touched on a little bit in the presentation, but again, this is a question that I, probably the most common question that I've gotten in the last um, four or five years or so is, is working on a lot of these different projects. Category zero is something that was, you know, included in that PPE categories method. Those tables used to be called the uh, hazard risk category or HRC categories in 2012. Category zero was dropped in 2015, and now in 2018, they, you know, they clarified the, the exception as to when you, when you need to print new labels. But what it boils down to is this, is you had those labels put on, um, you know, six years ago. The, the standard in, in place at that time you know, said category zero was something that was on those tables. So as long as the equipment that includes that label, if, if, the, if the conductors and the power coming to that equipment hasn't changed, if that piece of equipment's still in the same location, um, you know, circuit breaker settings, all that stuff is still the same as it was, then that label is, is still accurate. And I think, like I said earlier, 2018 um, really did a good job of, in clarifying that if, if everything is still the same, and that label was accurate at the time it was installed and met the standards in place at that time, then those are still accurate. So um, if it's been six years, you should have someone come in and do a review of your overall uh, arc flash risk assessment to make sure everything's still good, but you shouldn't necessarily uh, have to replace that label just because of the date. How do the tables require PPE where incident energy would not require PPE beyond a cotton shirt and safety glasses? So I think what they're asking there is, you know, looking at those tables. The table starts off with category one, right? There is no longer a category zero. Um, and, and that was done specifically for that reason, actually. So when category zero existed in the tables, um, you know, you could invite, you know, you're not doing an incident energy analysis method. You didn't have a consultant come out and, and look at everything specifically, um, but you could still, using those tables, say, okay, you know, based on, you know, these tables, I'm seeing category zero, so I'm good with my cotton. Um, if you don't have someone do that work for you and you're going to use those tables, they purposely got rid of zero to make it more conservative and put you in a situation where you now have to be wearing category one. Uh, which would be that, uh, at a minimum, you know, four cal rated clothing uh, and a face shield. So um, if you want to get to the level where your employees might just have to wear, you know, a natural non-melting 
cotton fiber clothing, then according to those two methods, the only two options we have, then you're going to have to do that incident energy analysis. Because if you do the incident energy analysis, a lot of stuff you're going to calculate, and, and you will find a lot in any given facility that will be less than 1.2 calories per centimeter squared. And that's, you know, that's in that situation where you can wear the cotton. But if you're using the tables, again, they're being conservative and they're pushing you to have to wear some type of arc-rated clothing. How often should affected employees be trained? So affected employees should be trained at a minimum of every three years. Uh, and that's, that's just kind of the baseline. Uh, what NFPA 70E goes additionally to then say is, you know, if, if you have an employee who was trained, but then say maybe their job duties or job activities changed, well, they should be retrained. Um, code also then talks about the fact that, you know, we should be doing, or the employer should be doing some type of uh, audit, you know, annual audit to, to make sure that our employees are showing and that they can actually perform the work and the stuff that we've asked them to properly and follow our procedures. If during those audits we see that our employees are not following the safety practices properly, then at that point in time they should also be retrained. So three years is the baseline, but if we're seeing things that um, aren't good, uh, basically to kind of put it simply, or if job duties change, then retraining could be, you know, more frequent. Who is responsible for labeling equipment, the owner of the equipment or the employer of the persons who are servicing the equipment? So that's a question I run into, you know, so the owner of the equipment or the employer of the persons who are servicing the equipment. So I'm, I'm guessing this has to do with someone who might be um, like a, a HVAC technician or a generator technician where they're coming into a facility that they don't own uh, and working on stuff, and, and how do they then force, you know, hey, you know, I'm coming into your facility, you don't have equipment labels, what, you know, what's, what's responsible there? Uh, the way the code reads is the owner of the equipment is the one responsible for laboring, labeling it. Now, you know, I do come into circumstances where maybe um, someone is working in a leased building, and they say, well, geez, you know, I'm leasing this building, it might be a long-term lease or whatever, but they'll say, hey, I'm leasing it, you know, I can't get the person who owns the building to put these art flash labels on, so what do we do then? Well, the employer is, uh, of course, responsible for his employees. So, you know, the employer does uh, have to make sure that his employees, you know, um, that his employees know what's going on, and they do have to, you know, do what they can to, to get those labels on there. But at the end of the day, code does read. It says the, the equipment owner is responsible for that labeling. Okay, last questions. Question, sorry. What are the qualifications for the individual who conducts the risk assessment? So that's another one of those interesting questions, and I think that's a little, I think what, he's, what um, um, the person who asked that question might be trying to get to is, do you have to be a professional engineer or a PE to do a type of risk assessment? And uh, the, the real answer to that is it's going to vary a little bit um, depending on where you're at in the country, state by state, uh, you know, county by county, uh, very, you know, different municipalities. Basically, in order to do a risk assessment, uh, OSHA, NFPA 70, these books do not say that you have to be a professional engineer, um, that, you know, basically you have to be qualified, you have to understand how to use uh, the tables, you have to understand how to do the calculations and all that type of stuff. Uh, so you could have, you know, electricians, uh, engineers, uh, other consultants that, that know how to do this work, you know, technically could be qualified. But then uh, I do run across quite a few AHJs or authority having jurisdiction that'll say, well, you know, um, you know, our, our state legislator or various different things indicate that, you know, to do an engineering study, you have to be a licensed electrical engineer. And most people consider an arc flash risk assessment uh, an engineered study, and they want it to fall underneath uh, the requirements and the ethics of, uh, you know, professional engineering. So it's always good to make sure a PE is involved, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. But if there is a concern, I would, you know, run it by a local fire marshal or building inspector, whoever has jurisdiction over your building, to see if they're going to want a PE involved in that process. 
Thank you. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions, but all of today's unanswered questions will be forwarded on to our speaker. Once again, I hope you take the time to fill out the evaluation survey on your screen to give us your feedback. That ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. I'd like to thank Josh Michaels, everyone at Brady Safety Software and Services, and all of you who listened in. Thanks, and have a great day.